Welcome, everyone. I'm going to go ahead and get started. My name is Arzu Osanlu, and I welcome my colleague Kabiri Robinson. Thank you so much for joining us. We are coming to you from the University of Washington's Simpson Center for the Humanities. And we welcome you to our Sawyer Seminar on Humanitarianisms, Migrations and Care Through the Global South. With the support of the Mellon Foundation, this year-long comparative study of humanitarianism seeks to decolonize the rhetoric of humanitarianism by examining the histories and practices of care for forced migrants that have developed outside of the global north. So this seminar is grounded in a set of theoretical concerns about the traditions of care and cultures of hospitalities in parts of the world that are responsible for hosting the lion's share of the world's refugees. Indeed, some 85% of refugees seek shelter and remain in the global south, primarily in Muslim majority countries. We seek to move beyond the global north as the primary locus of the study of humanitarianism and to emphasize instead experiences in regions across the global south with a particular emphasis on South and Southeast Asia, the Middle East and Africa. Over the course of the seminar year, we compare the conceptual categories that organize humanitarian practices and illuminate how values beyond those of the Western Enlightenment constitute suffering, practices of care, and who or what qualifies as worthy of that care. Today's event is the third of three in the theme Comparative Humanitarianisms. Here, we continue the work of decentering the West from ownership of humanitarianism by asking what other humanitarian logics shape when and how communities provide care to forced migrants. Our speakers ask us to explore a new global humanitarian project as one founded on diverse practices that recognize human suffering, the labor and principles of care, and the material and affective expressions of caring. Thus, they invite us to examine the ethical systems, logics, and rationalities that underlie everyday practices of humanitarianism across cultural and religious traditions in the global south. And we are so delighted to welcome Professors Basak Iqbal and China Schertz, who will extend this conversation on the ethics of care in other humanitarian logics as they consider the role of divine suffering in Islam and charitable gifts in Christianity with insights from their extensive research in Jordan and Uganda, respectively. Our colleague, Christian Kapotetsku, the postdoctoral scholar for this Sawyer seminar, will be the moderator of today's question and answer session. And we now turn to him to introduce our speakers to you. Thank you, Kabiri. And I would like to welcome our panel today, starting with Professor China Schertz, who will speak on charity work in Uganda, and Professor Basit Iqbal, who will explore an Islamic ethics of care in a Jordanian refugee camp. Basit Iqbal is Assistant Professor of Anthropology at McMaster University in Canada. He's currently working on his book project, Tribulation and Repair Islamic Humanitarianism After the Syrian War. Chana Schertz is Associate Professor of Anthropology at the University of Virginia. She's the author of Having People, Having Heart, Charity, Sustainable Development and Problems of Dependence in Uganda, published with University of Chicago Press in 2014. And I would also like to give our discussant, Danny Hoffman, a warm welcome. Danny Hoffman is professor for the study and prevention of violence at the Jackson School of International Studies and chair of the African Studies Program at the University of Washington. And now, without further ado, I would like to welcome China, Basit, and Danny, and let them say a few words before we start. Thank you so much for those warm words of welcome. Delighted to be here and looking forward to the conversation. Yes, likewise. Very much appreciate it and looking forward. And I'll echo that as well. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. And thank you to, to our invited guests and to the organizers. It's great. Looking forward to it. Thank you to the organizers for convening this remarkable series of discussions, even in these COVID times. I've been following along and have learned a lot, and I'm grateful to be part of this conversation. I'm speaking to you now from Hamilton, Ontario, from lands that are the traditional territory shared between the Haudenosaunee Confederacy and the Anishinaabe Nations, acknowledged in the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement, 
My paper today sketches out an ethical project of Islamic pedagogy in Zaatari refugee camp in North Jordan. In doing so, I'm encouraged by the seminar's insistence on decentering the West from presumptive ownership of humanitarianism. What happens to the category of humanitarianism if we take it not as a concept defined by certain principles, so universality, neutrality, humanity, and so on, but as an historical field of power and knowledge in which different projects of care are variously distributed and articulated? Peter Redfield and Erica Bornstein urge anthropologists to historicize humanitarianism's universal claims and its secular focus in the frame of global politics. And Miriam Tickton has written about the need to make space for other affective and political grammars in response to suffering, injustice, and death, other that is beyond the grammar of humanitarianism. While Amira Mittermeier has written eloquently about what she calls simply the non-humanitarian ethics of Islamic charity in post-revolutionary Cairo. Whether arguing for expanding or for restricting the category of humanitarianism, the historical and ethnographic entanglement of different projects of care demands more specific accounts of their varying formations. My co-panelist, China Shures, has already argued for attention to distinct orientations toward time, hierarchy, motivation, suffering, agency, and more. So my brief paper now is presented in that same spirit, not to claim that my interlocutors are paragons of piety or that religion is the only way to understand their actions, but instead to lay out an account of Islamic pedagogy in a site of humanitarian government. Zatari camp lies 10 kilometers east of the city of Mafraq at the southernmost edge of the plains of Hauran. The low-lying camp first becomes visible as slips of white on the horizon, tent canvas and trailers reflecting in the sun, then passing from view behind hills as the yellow-red dust of the Syrian desert sweeps across roads and rises in plumes behind vehicles. The massive scale of the camp is difficult to grasp from the highway, certainly not from its entrance, which is manned by Jordanian military police checking ID and exit permits. This paper is based on some field work from summer 2018, when the camp hosted nearly 80,000 refugees six years after it had been opened. The Abdullah bin Mubarak Religious Education Institute sits on the far side of the camp, away from the bustle of the market streets and the school buildings. Metal trailers are there arranged to form a spare courtyard, which is covered against the sun by corrugated metal sheets. The courtyard walls are painted in greens and blues, depicting riverine scenes and lush foliage, visions of paradise in strong contrast to the desert and the dust outside. The teacher giving me a tour in June 2018 led me into their large library trailer. Round plastic tables circled with chairs filled the center of the caravan, while the walls were lined with bookshelves divided according to genre. The other caravans circling the courtyard included a mosque, a women's classroom, and a small plot of a playground with flowers scrawled on the walls. I am your brother, Abu Bakr, the program director introduced himself. A large man with a deep voice in his late 40s, he has studied Sharia at Al-Azhar University in Cairo and arrived at Zatari in July 2012, just after the camp opened. Unlike many other Syrians I met in Jordan, who had entered the camp much later or who had stayed only as long as they had to, his perspective on the camp extended over its whole span. He found a vocation there. As I stayed here, he said, I found that I had to, as a scholar say, purify the religious knowledge I had gathered. Just like when a person has wealth, he must withdraw zakat from it. It's the same thing with religious knowledge, an ilm al shar'i. Here in the camp, our family are in need of learning the religious sciences. Praise God, we began our program to that end, and we're continuing to expand its activities. In the longer version of this paper, I lay out some of those activities in some detail. For now, suffice it to say that it supported three programs corresponding to distinct pedagogical objectives. This included a program supporting orphans and widows, that is, the families whose menfolk had been imprisoned or disappeared or killed by the regime in Syria, 
a program for Quran memorization, and a four-year program of Islamic studies covering such topics as theology, hadith, and Islamic law and legal theory. As Abu Bakr explained, in the first months of life in Zatari, he and his friends had observed that people in the camp increasingly did have their daily sustenance provided for. But there was another dearth there, one which the international aid community could not address. Man cannot live by bread alone, he explained. There is a need for the provision of religious knowledge, which orders one's personal rituals of worship, prayer, and fasting, and charity, but also one's relations with others. So religious knowledge guides a person through life, safeguarding one from unknowingly falling into sin. And the aim wasn't only providing ethical juridical coordinates for individual lives, um, it also served a communal function in creating a legitimate space for the exercise of religious differences. So the mandate of these programs was to attend the individual and the collective need for religious knowledge. In that same initial interview with Abu Bakr, I mentioned that some of my other interlocutors frequently described the Syrian crisis, Azme, as a divine trial. He had heard this before too, and he immediately wanted to qualify that claim. We can call it a trial, in Ibtida, he replied, a divine test, certainly, and a purification of sins. We can say that at a general level, but what about those who had no sins, who were still killed, still injured, still exiled? It's not a divine tribulation for them, or for their families, or for the elderly. So he first affirmed tribulation as an appropriate term, but then specified its scope, exempting the weak and the vulnerable from its logic and directing it, in fact, toward those who were not afflicted by the worst. Abu Bakr did not demand a singular response to the ordeal or prescribe how one might pass the divine test. Instead, he turned the trope of tribulation toward a question of capacity. Facing the disaster, he said, some can provide medicine, others food, while yet others can resort only to the power of prayer. And that too is the situation that God put them in. And so they're excused, ma'zur, from doing anything further. But is one excused? What is one's capacity? How does one determine what lies within one's strength? One must ask oneself these questions, whether touched by the event directly or standing adjacent to it. I remembered Peter Singer's utilitarian hypothesis, where he insists that we have an obligation to aid distant strangers no less than a drowning child before us, um, in an equation that's become crucial to different humanitarian logics. For Singer, interference only enters the ethical scene because most of us do not face the latter scenario directly, and so we're able to avoid our obligations. Like Singer, and however many of us are exempted due to our weakness, Abu Bakr's insistence on our ability to act cut through that interference. So in something like Primo Levi's distinction between victims and survivors, victims being those true witnesses who touched bottom, who saw the Gorgon and did not return, and survivors being those who bear witness to a missing testimony, um, the divine trial puts to the test not those who suffer the worst, but those who are adjacent to it. So Abu Bakr effectively distinguishes between the affliction and the tribulation, where the latter tests everyone who is contiguous to the former. This was compelling, but I wondered if he was not simplifying this procedure, because if the trial produces a duty, how can one adjudicate between multiple duties? He recognized that there is more than one call. The Syrian crisis is not the only crisis. And so there may be hierarchies of concern and competing obligations. For Levinas, it's this crowded ethical scene that requires more than love for the neighbor. If there were only to have been responsibility toward one single other, love would suffice. But the call of a third requires justice beyond love. Derrida reads these mutually exclusive obligations as providing the passage from ethics to politics, ethics as in the mode of hospitality to the other, and politics on behalf of the figure of the third. A politics based on ethics is certainly necessary, even though it risks perverting ethics, but it must never forget in any decision that it is the singular relation to the mortality and the vulnerability of the other that matters. 
Abu Bakr himself, of course, did not venture an answer to this conflict of love and justice. Instead, he had cited the Quran in the verse on the screen there. In doing so, he deferred that Derridian problem of politics by making the question of one's obligation in relation to one's ability already heteronymous, meaning already bound up with the supplication that God not impose a burden beyond one's strength. So what's key here is less the mortality and the vulnerability of the other in relation to oneself and other others, but the recursive duties to God that can only be met through recognizing one's own position between affliction and tribulation. Abu Bakr himself perceived his own obligation as being to answer the need for religious knowledge and guidance in the camp, a need that few others could or would fulfill. And so he stayed in Zatari long after he could have left. But this wasn't quite a gesture of self-sacrifice like those Didi Fassin and Lisa Malki have explored in humanitarian sites premised on the division of victims from humanitarians, victims being those whose lives are passively sacrificable and humanitarians being those whose lives are freely given. Instead, I would say that his account of tribulation registers the disclosive force of ascesis, that is how truth demands putting oneself at stake in its pursuit. Before I left Zatari that day, I absentmindedly paged through a book from the coffee table in that office trailer, a colorful hardback print of al Tirmidhi's popular Al-Shama'il al-Muhammadiyya, which lists 400 reports um, of the Prophet, uh, forming an ekphrastic portrait of his gait and his posture, his manner and his tone, and in some offering a repository of gestures for readers to repeat and thereby inherit. A lengthy ballpoint inscription caught my eye as I flipped past the introduction, a supplication by the teachers who read the book together, asking the protector exalted and glorified, meaning God, to honor us through its recitation and to make the book a proof for us, not against us, on the Day of Judgment. So their, their seeking knowledge of religion was also perilous, for it could bear witness against them with little security against these potentially dire consequences of their claiming of the religious inheritance. So their eschatological fate is bound up in their effort to inherit this body of gestures, to engage the religious tradition. For these teachers in Zatari camp, tribulation brings one to what Christian Jean Bey calls the thresholds of reflection, to affirming the abyssal unity of truth and ascesis, but also ultimately to facing a different kind of risk, uh, due to an ambivalence internal to this tradition. As Abu Bakr himself had told me, there is an exorbitance, a tohuyan, that coagulates in knowledge when it lies inert, which can only be expunged um, by living according to it and teaching it to others. The inheritance of the prophets is knowledge, not one of wealth or dinars or dirhams, an inheritance which is passed among generations by those who can bear it. But it's a dangerous inheritance, as the eponym of this program, Abdullah bin Mubarak, had warned long ago. An inheritance dangerous because it turns against those who claim it. I had begun this paper with a question invited by the seminar theme. What happens to the category of humanitarianism if, if it is confronted with a project of care like this, whose object is not people's physical suffering, but their ethical religious capacities? It's motivated less by compassion for a distant other than by a recognition of one's own implication in an existing set of relationships to God and to others. And its horizon is not that of the day's emergency, but a temporality braiding the present and the afterlife together. And although Abu Bakr had recognized the innocence of certain victims, he had done so less to establish a hierarchy of sufferings than to drive a wedge between the event of affliction and the divine tribulation. For all these reasons and others, his vision is clearly different from the schools coordinated in Zatari camp by UNICEF and international NGOs. But these distinct projects are also adjacent to each other, physically in the camp and as lived in the week's rhythm. The camp administrators are anxious about what happens in these programs, which are popular and taking place under their noses. They repeatedly tried setting up meetings to learn about these programs, but 
the Islamic teachers were clearly uninterested or wary. A report I read says with some annoyance that only three people showed up to their rescheduled focus group session and offered only very general information. Can we avoid repeating at the level of analysis the Islamic teacher's wariness and the camp administrator's anxiety? That, it seems to me, is what this Sawyer seminar theme invites us toward in putting distinct projects of care into conversation. Thank you. Hello, my name is China Schurz, and I'm an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Virginia. My talk is entitled, Seeking the Wounds of the Gift, Recipient Agency in Catholic Charity and Chaganda Patronage. Like all values and categories, the values of independence and self-reliance are socially and historically constructed. In my talk today, I will explore how this claim might help us to rethink current trends towards fiscal sustainability and community participation in international development and philanthropy. My approach reframes these international debates concerning the most effective ways to respond to the needs of vulnerable populations by focusing attention on the ethical judgments rural Ugandans make about the programs operating in their communities. Specifically, this talk asks what gifts, dependency, and attempts to avoid them mean in communities where patron-client relationships have long served as a primary ethical compass. In so doing, this talk draws on material from my book, Having People, Having Heart. The book was based on 12 months of fieldwork that I conducted with orphan support NGOs in the central region of Uganda and with their funders in the United States and Europe in 2007, 2008, and 2010. The book contrasts the work of the Ugandan NGO that I call Hope Child that came to embrace the logic of sustainable community-based development with the work of a group of Ugandan Franciscan nuns who ran a home for orphans and people with disabilities that I call Mercy House. Arguments concerning the moral valence of charitable gifts have a long history in anthropology and in critical studies of development and philanthropy. Concerns with dependency resonate with current approaches to sustainable development, which shift aid away from direct forms of material charity towards the propagation of participatory self-supporting micro-institutions. Under that logic of sustainability, the primary goal of many NGOs is to create community institutions that can assume the ownership of a project after an organization and its resources leave the community. Such efforts were central to the work of the Ugandan NGO I call Hope Child. The Hope Child's attempts to avoid handouts ultimately led to tensions between field office staff and program beneficiaries. While the staff members of Hope Child were interested in creating support groups for grandparents caring for orphans, providing HIV prevention trainings, and building community-run early childhood development centers, the program beneficiaries wanted medical care, farm implements, livestock, school fees, and mattresses. But despite their discursive ownership of the project, the program beneficiaries were not able to convince Hope Child to spend any more than 6% of their budget on their ideas. While the NGO staff and the donor foundations that supported them saw this refusal of handouts as part of a strategy to avoid aid dependence and to promote programs that would yield lasting benefits, the beneficiaries saw these same choices as suspect refusals to redistribute wealth and echoed a refrain familiar across the African continent that the NGO staff was likely eating the money. Crucially, their sense of injustice was tied to the contributions of labor and other goods that were regularly demanded from them. In order to ensure long-term sustainability, Hope Child not only needed to avoid material entanglements, it also needed to establish community ownership of the orphan support projects, thus making community participation an important end in itself. For many months, Hope Child's participants readily responded to their requests for voluntary labor, and those who complied with the request looked forward to the possibility that Hope Child might be able to provide them with capital for their businesses, school fees for their children, blankets for the, and blankets for their beds in exchange for all of this dedicated service. Ironically, what was for Hope Child a demonstration of the community taking ownership of the project 
was for par participants a way of securing the support of a powerful patron and effectively entering into a relationship of dependency. But after many months of voluntary service, the participants found that material gifts of mattresses and school fees were not forthcoming. While the situation led the project beneficiaries to privately accuse the Hope Child staff of corruption, I want to propose an alternate reading of this situation. The ideology of economic sustainability led to a situation in which the Hope Child staff had no choice but to refuse the mantle of patronage that the people of Sibanda so eagerly held out to them. The administrative requirements of new regimes of audit and commitments to sustainability created a, sit a situation in which concrete material assistance was virtually impossible. And so the participants decided to stop volunteering. If Hope Child was not going to play the role of the good patron, they weren't going to waste their time playing the role of the client. The interactions between Hope Child and its beneficiaries illuminate a misunderstanding which led both sides to accuse the other of a moral failing. In this moment of conflict, there is a temptation to see a cliche divide between the modern West and the tradition bound rest. Yet, when we look at the interactions between Catholic charity, patronage, and a second strand of the Chaganda ethical assemblage, we find a case of congruence rather than conflict. In contemporary Luganda, the term omutima omuyambi, literally the heart for helping, is used to explain acts of kindness and generosity that extend beyond one's specific obligations and which are free of expectations of reciprocity. While givers can expect to be thanked for their efforts, the people who act with the intention of concretely benefiting cannot be classified as being motivated by real heart. Like other Ugandans, the Franciscan Sisters of Africa who work at Mercy House have woven together notions of patronage, omutima omuyambi, and Christian ideas of charity over the 80 years since Mercy House was founded, and it's to their efforts that I now turn. Mercy House was founded shortly after the Franciscan Sisters of Africa took their vows in 1928 so that the newly professed Ugandan sisters could bring food to the poor. It was in this sense a quote unquote school of charity and thought to be critical to the young sisters ongoing formation. While they often make explicit linkages between charity and Omutima Omuyambi, in watching the sisters interactions with the children and families they came in contact with, it became clear that they were participating in an ethical assemblage that combined charity with both Omutima Omuyambi and patronage, drawing on different forms as the situation demanded. The sisters working at Mercy House regularly took in children and adults who were unknown to them, some of them having literally been left at the gate. Yet in other cases, the sisters were caring for children in a way that more closely resembled indigenous patron-client relationships. In many cases, the sisters were caring for children whose parents had purposely built labor-based relationships with the sisters before they became unable to care for their own children themselves. It was in this way that children like Paul Kassirie, whose father had worked as the sister's driver, and Nalungu Margaret, whose mother had been one of the cooks, had come under the care of the sisters. Both of the parents had worked for the sisters, and when they passed away, the sisters felt obliged to care for the children they left behind. In other cases, future obligations were established through longer, more tenuous exchanges of requests and gifts. One afternoon, Sister Jane described the way in which one child's mother had established a relationship with the sisters. She said, when I was a novice in the formation house, Tamusanga's mother used to come with her children. She had rashes all over. They had not yet started with the ARVs and she would come and beg food every lunch. She would bring us leaves for steaming bananas. When she died, Tamusanga and his sister were brought to this home. In coming to the novitiate each day, Tamusanga's mother was not only looking for food, rather through her gifts and daily requests, she was working to establish a bond with the sisters that obliged them to care for her and her family. Some of Mercy House's other residents had also been actively involved in seeking the sisters' patronage in an effort to pursue their own plans. When she was in primary five, Namika Rebecca, a young woman with spina bifida, met one of the sisters near her home. During an interview in June 2010, she said, the sisters were so beautiful, dressed all in white and smiling. They saw the condition I was in crawling on the ground, and they said they wanted to take me to Mercy House to go to school. 
I was very excited about this idea and went home and told my mother. My mother refused and kept me at home. When I was nearing the end of primary seven, I went to my mother and asked what her plans were for me. She said she was planning to put me in tailoring. I said, I didn't wanna do tailoring. I wanted to do academics. And I was leaving to go to the sisters so that they would send me to school. I traveled here and started school across the way at St. Anthony's. Namika, who has now finished her degree at Makerere University and is working as a disability rights activist, saw the presence of Mercy House and the sisters offer of an education as allowing her to make her own choices about her life plans and to pursue her own academic goals. While depending on the sisters was not without its challenges, Namika's primary experience of their charity was not one of shame and the burden of an unrepayable debt, but rather focused on the success of having effectively recruited a powerful and generous patron. Charity was one of the primary examples of the symbolic violence that Pierre Bourdieu spent his career writing about. As he wrote, wealth can only exert power and exert it durably in the form of symbolic capital. And as such, gifts become one of the primary ways in which the wealth retained their dominance. Bourdieu argued that this is made possible through a collective misrecognition in which both giver and receiver see gifts as, as gratu gratuitous and unrequited generosity. Yet, when we suspend our reliance on misrecognition and look more closely at the experiences of givers and receivers, we find Bourdieu's argument concerning the necessary violence of charity questionable. By opening our analyses to the moral contingency of the gift, we can attend to the specificities of particular gifts rather than assuming universal motivations and outcomes. In returning to my original question, we find that in contexts context in which interdependent hierarchies serve as legitimate moral forms, in which those with resources have a moral obligation to take on clients, attempts to avoid dependency can easily be interpreted as acts of corruption. By contrast, the charity of Mercy House is seen as consistent with, but not identical to the Chiganda virtues of patronage and non-reciprocal mutimo muyambi. Finally, I want to note that in the sisters' decision to engage in charity in the way that they do represents a way of thinking that focuses on what they as individuals and as a community ought to do, not on developing a definitive solution to the problem of poverty. Taking a cue from their approach, we find that the normative question to be addressed undergoes a critical shift. We move from the abstract question, how can we bring about an end of poverty, to the personal. What are the ethical possibilities open to me in my particular position? While resisting the prescriptive impulse that this question raises, I wanna close by drawing attention to what this work has to tell us about possible answers to this second question. Reflecting on this question in relation to Chaganda ethics, I have often thought about a disjuncture between Hope Child's reliance on the image of the interdependent African village and its simultaneous exclusion of itself or its foreign donors from that vision. I think of a walled compound contain containing Sabanda's residents who are supposed to work together in harmony and solidarity. This is the proverbial village that is supposed to quote unquote, raise the child. While NGOs and their donors might occasionally enter this walled compound to make a one-time gift or to hold trainings for the people within, they are effectively forbidden from maintaining an ongoing material relationship. Although proponents of sustainable development claim that this wall exists to protect the villagers from dependence, I argue that the donors have built this imaginary wall to protect themselves. If the NGOs and the donors were to tear it down, they would have to consider themselves as part of that community and thus be subject to the demands of the, of the villagers seeking to create a deeper social and material relationship. The socially and materially thick relationships that might result would prevent cosmopolitan donors and NGOs from easily moving from place to place and would undoubtedly decrease the number of people they could claim as beneficiaries. But in exchange for their beneficiary numbers and their freedom, they might actually see some improvement in people's lives. In closing, let me clarify that I'm not arguing for a return to charity or other forms of hierarchical giving as universal models for interrelationship. Rather, I believe that they should not be rejected out of hand in places where interdependence and hierarchy carry a positive or at least ambivalent moral valence. I thus hope to have unsettled foregone conclusions about the ethics and effects of dependence in the post-colonial world 
and in doing so have opened a space of possibility to consider old and new forms of attachment. Thank you for your time. Um, I hope that you enjoyed this talk and that it raised some good questions for you. Great. Um, thank you both very much. So um, now we get to transition into the the discussion part of the um, uh, of the program, which um, uh, which I'll, I'll kick us off with. First of all, just by saying thank you uh, to both of you for these great talks. This is this is really rich. This has been a fantastic series in general, and this is a, a kind of the perfect uh, addition to it. So my role here as the discussion is actually quite easy, thanks to the two of you. Um, I am just supposed to uh, get get you all talking, ideally to each other, um, and also to the theme that we have for the quarter, comparative humanitarianisms. I have uh, I have a couple of questions that I'm hoping that we can use as a way to begin this the, a conversation. And I want to start with a, a, a talking a little bit about keywords. Um, it, it seems to me that it, both of you introduce a number of ways to think about, um, on, kind of, um, allow us to think about this idea of comparative humanitarianisms through a new set of keywords. And um, I'm curious as, and this is a bit of a thought exercise, I suppose, to have you take keywords from each other's work and address them in relation to your own. So um, I chose two um, from China's project, uh, this term patronage, um, and from Bassett's project, the term tribulation. Now I would suggest that, that both of these terms are either completely invisible or uncomfortable in the kind of humanitarian, dominant humanitarian discourses. Um, but they figure prominently into the, the landscapes that you're introducing us to. So I'm gonna ask you, uh, maybe a little bit unfairly, to take the other's key term and think about what it might mean in terms of your own project. How might it help us or help you to think in a slightly different way uh, if you're sort of using the vocabulary of your of your counterpart. Um, if you have other keywords that you think would work better to do this experiment with, feel free to go go for it if you have questions for each other. But um, I'm going to turn it over to the two of you to uh, uh, to see what you see what you do with that. China, would you start? Or sure, I'm, I'm glad to. Um, and I'm so glad that you've asked this question, because in listening to Bossett's presentation, I was like, oh, that sounds so familiar in, in some ways, and then maybe not in others. And so I want to try to answer, and then I'm going to sort of add on a question to Bossett, which maybe he'll answer it at some point. But um, I think that the idea of tribulation very much plays into the kinds of works that the sisters are doing. I didn't get to it so much in this particular presentation, but thinking about the sort of divine economy of charity is something that's very much part of their world. So in giving to these children, they are giving directly to God, that, that this idea that the, in, in the sort of figure of the, the suffering child or the person at the gate is an opportunity perhaps to give to Jesus himself and that they very much see what they're doing in that sense. And then this chain of, of, sort, of, of sort of divine economy overlaps with the economy of patronage, of thinking about oneself as both um, a sort of heavenly client and patron of others and the way that that sort of all circulates around in, in quite complex ways, which also include the children who th themselves talk about having been given a gift at one time, they couldn't give back to that person, but now they are giving to someone else. And then there's a whole sort of logic around, um, around them as, as being able to give through prayer um, and, and so that's very much a part of things. One question I have about the sort of question of the test is that even though there is a bit of this in the sense that like I am being, I'm being tested and that this is part of sort of my, uh, for a sister, sort of her project of, of salvation, I'm not sure if it plays out in exactly the same way because I don't know enough about Islam. So this is my question for Bassett in terms of a test, what is, what is the outcome of the test? Because for the sisters to sort of, um, Theology around salvation is sort of grace and works combined. So there's this sort of whole piece of grace that comes on top of whatever it is that you're doing. And then there's a whole sort of logic of sacraments um, through which they're going to go to confession, they're going to go to communion, they're going through baptism, they're going through, you know, all of these processes that are also part of that story of salvation. So the idea that, you know, the answer to one test or another would determine anything, I think they would, would reject. Um, and even their own capacity to respond well to the test um, is in their thinking largely divinely determined. And that's something that I've written about um, in another paper on moral failure and sort of how do sisters understand the sisters who are not very kind to children and what it is that's going on um, for them in their own process of moral formation. So I'll turn it over to Basit. 
All right, thank you. I've been thinking about what the term patronage would would uh, you know would bring to this project and ask me to kind of foreground that that I don't hear. Um, and there are a few things I think. So so for, for one, I, I do think there's a kind of maybe family resemblance between uh, between patronage and the like the, the teacher student model of Islamic pedagogy in general, um, which is also a, a relationship of dependency in that it's like it's through the embodied example of the teacher and not just his or her transmission of knowledge that students are inducted into this tradition and so there, there's a there's a certain kind of analogy between maybe the, the role of a teacher and a patron and the role of a student and a client in, in, in a certain sense um thinking about it more, more kind of expansively i think could also uh, take us beyond like a, a dyad form of like between patron and client to thinking more about networks of patronage. Um, and so I remember at one point Abu Bakr who, who himself certainly plays the role of patron to you know students in the camp in various ways was expressing his gratitude to the Jordanian government and also to uh, wealthy donors from Gulf states who donated money and textbooks and so on. So so foregrounding patronage would lead me to these kinds of um, nested commitments and what they entail. And more broadly, I guess, to um, the, the political economy in the camp in general, in which different kinds of like material and, and cultural capital are circulating and within which uh, his, his role as both patron and client is negotiated. Um, I do also remember kind of in that same interview with him, he, he was specifically expressing gratitude for permission to establish this pedagogical space and not for, you know, uh, provisions of food and drink and shelter that were afforded in the camp. And so that kind of stood out to me as, as, as though that much was um, like even like the rightful claim of those who are displaced. And so uh, it, it, it feels like foregrounding patronage would also lead me back to the particularities of an Islamic ethics of giving um, as it's entangled with humanitarian aid in the space of the camp. I think um, kind of going to, to China's question or her, her kind of pointing out this question that the, the, the relationship of like the end of the test, um, part of what I find, what's drawn me, I guess, to this term as one of the key terms that I, key theological terms that I'm trying to follow in its different social life um, is that there's a, a recursive quality to it. And so, um, you know, in kind of more, more broadly in, in different Islamic genres. And so, um, you know, health and illness and wealth and uh, poverty are all tribulations of various sorts. And some are certainly more uh, arduous than others, <laughs> uh, certainly, but, but um, there's this recursive quality to a test or a tribulation in which, um, you know, in, in which the ultimate result or the end result is only going to be disclosed in some kind of eschatological scene and not, you know, in, in the kind of the immediate space of, um, you know, of passing one test or passing another and so on. And, and they're kind of, uh, they're mutually imbricated as well. But oh, I'll leave it there for now. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll exercise my discuss and, uh, privileges and jump back into the conversation because I think this is a, it's, I mean, it's fascinating to hear this be, and it raises a, a kind of a parallel issue for me that I wanted to ask you about. Because so I, I, as somebody who um, has worked in West Africa in the kind of 1990s, 2000s era of Po, you know, conflict and post-conflict NGO interventions in, in a particularly difficult war. I think there was a, you know, there was a lot of writing that came out of that, which said, um, you know, the international NGO humanitarian apparatus came in and wiped out other forms of care, right? It shaped, it, it, it eliminated the other possibilities. And what I think both of you are pointing to, both in the talks, but also in your, in this conversation is we need to think in a, in a more complicated way about what gets triangulated, what how things begin to interact, both the kind of spiritual networks, but as as Basit, as you said, the sort of um, you know the political economy of the camp, and so that sort of prompts for me this question, and I'm going to steal another of your terms here, Basit, if you don't mind, adjacency, right? You're both talking about ethnographic cases 
where there's an adjacency of, of one, a regime of care to another, which we tend to identify more with this international NGO apparatus, right? And I want you to talk a little bit, if you would, about this, this the notion of these, the way these intertwine or the way they sit next to each other spatially, temporally, in terms of resources, however you, you want to take this. But again, if you maybe you could, I could direct this a little bit more by asking you to think about, is the adjacency that we see here the same in both of your projects? Do you recognize the adjacency of the two physical sites or temporal sites, spiritual sites in, in the work that you're doing? Um, maybe I can jump in on this. I mean, I think for Mercy House, it's, it's adjacent. It, I think that sort of sense that, that other forms of care were driven out in the sort of move to NGOs was certainly true. I mean, Mercy House hadn't disappeared. It was completely unsustainable, but it had been in continuous operation since the 1920s. But like during the period of my field work, they lost several of their major funders because they weren't willing to restrict their population in certain ways. They weren't willing to um, sort of move, shift sort of their mode of engagement. And they started wanting to keep doing things as they were, which was this very unpopular kind of institutional orphanage. And after I left the field, that kind of institutional care was actually banned in Uganda. And so they had to send all of those kids out. They weren't allowed to keep them anymore. And the kids experienced that as having been thrown out, that somebody was angry with them and that they had been rejected and chased away. And uh, meanwhile, that, you know, a very sort of industrious new nun came in and she was able to write all kinds of grants and built all these buildings that were big and beautiful, but no kids were there anymore and no one was being looked after. So really kind of a tragic thing to watch, um, something that, that was a, a really value, valued space within a community be sort of pushed out in, in various ways and so sort of the regimes of audit, the need to sort of have a certain set of best practices did make it very hard for that to continue going. And um, it, it's gonna be, you know, something to, to keep watching for the, probably the rest of my life, but um, there, it certainly adjacent, if not something even more um, harsh than that word would, would be appropriate. I appreciate you kind of pointing out the term adjacent. I hadn't kind of uh, thought about it as as directly. I think there is certainly kind of there's there's at least kind of two maybe two ways of thinking adjacency that I'd um, that you know th th that were in the short paper. There one is kind of adjacency to the affliction, which is what you know convenes this question about capacity and tribulation, and then second there is adjacency of these different projects within the camp. Um, and and you know I think I, I I do assume that these sites are uh, you know complex spaces in which different projects of care are uh, entangled with each other and and I think that you know certainly came across in in uh, China's talk as well she talks about you know or she was just talking about charity and patronage um, and Omotimo Omoyambi is forming that kind of an ethical assemblage and I I didn't talk about it as an assemblage I. I use terms like entanglement or articulation, um, but but again, th thinking about maybe in the in these spatial terms, I was struck in her talk by the image of a wall which is built not to protect villagers from dependence, but to protect the donors themselves from um, you know getting too caught up in thick material relationships and. And um, I think that image of a wall around a village acts uh, similarly to what I was calling interference in this scene of moral obligation. Um, and, and what's interesting about there is that adjacency uh, isn't really about physical proximity or distance. It's also a political question as well. Um, and, so, and so there's this other kind of other dimension to these uh, spatial terms that we're using. Actually, could I could I push that last point just a little bit if we wanted to think about the kind of political adjacency because it does seem like and I'm, again maybe the China the descript the what you're describing sounds to me in some ways much more familiar to what I'm used to where there there really seems to be a discourse of incompatibility between regimes of care at least on the one hand the kind of donor driven you know 
hegemonic apparatus says that there, there can be no other spaces of care. And I, um, so maybe would, would you, and maybe Basit, you can sort of, I'll ask this a prompt to start you to continue that kind of political inter, interweaving. And then I'd be interested in going back to China. I mean, do you see that as well? Is there a kind of, because I got the impression from your talk that the, the uh, um, you know, the, the people running the, the focus group where only three people had showed up, right? I mean, sort of experienced this as threat. Like there is something else going on here that's actually a threat to our, am I reading too much into that? Or could you talk a little bit more about that kind of political, political adjacency, if you will, or whatever other term we want to use for it? Yeah, I mean, I think it was um, that, that, that sense of weariness and, and, you know, sense of threat, as you were saying, that um, kind of piqued my curiosity in the first place. I, you know, it was before I started my field work, I was uh, in California trying to read up on different reports that were, you know, of, of, you know I guess the, the scene of um, aid in Jordan and came across a few just kind of quite, quite uh, wary and, and kind of um, cautious about, uh, you know, different Islamic charities doing a lot of work with, um, you know, displaced Syrians, but, um, you know, they just kind of, these were reports written by, uh, you know, international NGOs for other international NGOs, trying to give people a sense of the lay of the land and, and try to, uh, you know, translate between uh, these different regimes of care. And, but also, you know, on the one hand, kind of um, assuaging their concerns, but also, Kind of pointing out things that that might be um, you know things to watch in the future, and you know arguing for uh, ultimately arguing for you know greater greater coordination in order to increase transparency um, and formal and and the formality of these other organizations, which often are more informal and have different access to you know other networks of aid and and, and donor streams and so on. Um, and so it was these kinds of reports that first. Um, piqued my curiosity both because of, you know, their their uh, the sense of threat but, and this anxiety, you know, about what these other programs are doing, um, and also because I I had the sense that many of these these other organizations initially had quite different mandates, right, of you know Islamic revival and education and so on, and then they moved into this area, uh, you know, more more recently, and so I was curious, I guess, to track that shift. I'm going to I'm going to put one last question on and then turn it over to our, our Q&A. Uh, just a, a quick one here. I'm going to ask you the anthropology question, um, which is specifically about ethnographic storytelling um, and what you see as being the the, you know, it, the part of this project is to sort of illuminate other ways of seeing the world, right? Um, which is built into the project of anthropology. But the, uh, you know, another piece of that is that you are then charged with telling that story. So I guess I'd just love to hear in a, in a kind of brief uh, recount what you see as being the challenges, the limitations, but also the possibilities of, of an ethnographic mode of storytelling for trying to, to deal with the cases that you're you're dealing with. And I'll um, I will take the answer off the air, and I'll just say thank you to both of you. I think ethnography is is how we as anthropologists learn the things we learn, and so being able to tell those stories back as we are trying to make arguments, I think is is sort of. I don't know, it's the reason I became an anthropologist. It just was such a, a beautiful way to learn and to share things. I think the challenge is that you always feel like, well, what if I told that other story? Maybe the argument would be completely different or maybe I'm leaving this thing out or overemphasizing this. And so trying, knowing that it is, it's not an objective science um, and trying to sort of be, re be very responsible about the choices that we make in which stories to tell how they're going to be received, the ways that people are getting sort of fixed in them in time and, and place, um, and always writing with an eye to knowing that the people who are in this book are, are whatever we're writing are going to be reading them. And that's a tricky thing to balance. I think I, I would, you know, cer certainly, I, I think I would just add that, um, I guess, specifically when it comes to this, these are more general questions, I guess, about ethnography in general um, and, and, you know, anthropological writing in general, but then specifically when it comes to, uh, you know, anthropology of humanitarianism, there's also kind of this, this other uh, way in which um, there is this kind of uncanny uh, doubleness, maybe we can say between the figure of the, the anthropologist and the figure of the humanitarian in that there's this kind of uh, growing um, maybe 
critique certainly of humanitarianism that you know it, it elicits compassion you know from uh, you know fr from from uh, you know observers and through and so through this compassion people are moved to act and then uh, in in similar ways uh, people have you know written about anthropologists also um, performing a similar kind of function when they take on this mantle of you know, of, of, of like the anthropologist as, as witness or something, you know, and so kind of exploiting um, different desperate situations for purposes of narrative. And so, um, you know, I, I, I don't think that's anything to, to uh, get away from easily. I, I just think it's part of the, the questions that need to animate the writing as well. And now we have some time to turn to the Q&A. So let me start with one for both of you. Have either of you considered how ethics of care are shaped in relation to gender? Um, I'm thinking specifically about the relationships between the Franciscan sisters and village mothers in Mercy House and Abu Bakr's relationship to his students in Zatari. Do homosocial relationships promote particular modalities of care in either context? Well, Mercy House is in a convent, so it's all women. Um, and they have you know, very intense relationships with one another because they all live together and work together. It's interesting though, because in a way, being a nun in Uganda, you're, just, you're much less gendered than other women are. You are in this kind of other space in which um, you're able to do all kinds of things and, and, and your life is not as controlled by men as it would be otherwise. Um, so I don't know. I mean, I think they certainly think of themselves as as mothers and and that kind of mothering is a big piece of what they're doing with children. Um, I think, you know, so it's there. It's not been a huge theme for me, I have to say, in general, in my work. So not a question I thought a lot about, but obviously um, lots of women and they are delight to be with. I think, I think for, for um... I'd say certainly in terms of the field work I did, it was with um, it, it was with male students and teachers in the camp. But Abu Bakr did make it a point of pride to you know to to insist right to me and also to others that um, you know it was the exact same curriculum you know for both uh, men and women um, and and uh, whenever he you know was was recounting. Um, the accomplishments of their program. He would, uh, you know, he, he would he would note how many of their graduates so far were um, were women and how many were men and so on as well. So certainly gendered in various ways, um, and and but at least you know from from his from his part there was this kind of insistence that there was a kind of uh, accessibility that they were aiming for, um, in part because you know one of the the Future vectors. I, I had mentioned in the in the talk that you know that the kind of temporality involved was you know braiding together the the present and the you know and the afterlife together. There was another horizon as well, and that was of a return to Syria at some point, and uh, that that in a way these classes, this program of Islamic ethical pedagogy, was to uh, prepare uh, the Syrians, men and women, to return you know, uh, at some point in the undetermined future, and then to become the people who kind of uh, foster uh, good relations between people and teach Islam and so on together. And so uh, gender certainly factors into that as well, but uh, wasn't something that I, it, it, it kind of a, a comparative view on that wasn't something that I had any access on in the field work. China, for you, can you say more about concepts of personhood or identity in the communities you spoke of and how that affects the ethics of giving? Yeah, I think the idea of an interde interdependent form of personhood is really central to understanding how that logic of patronage works. That 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 as a person, I, I'm not a per, I mean, it's this this sort of talk about Ubuntu that we get, you know, all across various bits of African studies, but this idea that my personhood is defined by my relationships with other people, that I am going to certainly want to achieve my own goals and my own vision for my life, and I've got plans and I've got things I'm moving forward with. But all of that is only accomplished through relationships with other people and that those relationships again are often hierarchical and they're materially mediated and I feel like that that understanding for me has been so critical 
was the hardest thing for me in field work to get my head around. I was like, no, no, I'm by myself in my little house doing my little thing and I'm going to do my own laundry and I'm not going to have any dependency relationships with anybody. And breaking out of that was very hard. And I think for anybody in the audience that's interested in anthropology, paying attention when something feels very uncomfortable is usually means that that's the thing you're supposed to write about. Um, but that idea that your personhood is, is completely dependent on others. Um, and that goes for everybody in society, not only for those at sort of the bottom edge of a hierarchy, um, I think is really central to the ethics of patronage and the ethics of giving and has now become really central to me in an ethics of collaborative writing and a separate project that I'm engaged in now. So um, that, that is a great question and, and very central to the project. For Basit is the next one. Uh, could you talk about your premise uh, to avoid interpreting your interlocutors as paragons of piety? Uh, and here specifically, um, could you elaborate on what kinds of misinterpretations or misreadings you were attempting to guard against? Was part of your argument that a broader approach open to multiple vantage points parallels the physical proximities between secular and Islamic humanitarian institutions? That's a very good question, and 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 um, I think the the uh, kind of the, the caveat that I'd introduce kind of toward the beginning of the talk there about you know not uh, you know about you know deep, kind of uh, admitting kind of from the, from the top that religion isn't the only way to approach you know these kinds of programs and so on um, is basically my my admission to the polemical context maybe of some of these discussions where. Uh, focusing on an, you know, an Islamic ethics of care like this can be seen as a distraction from, you know, like properly material political concerns and, you know, the 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 actual you know conditions of of um, you know of material hegemony and so on in the camp. Um, and so, um, I'd say I'd say that my own interest in this would be to um, certainly think about, you know, how, how different projects of care, different regimes of care are, um, are proximate, adjacent, as we were saying earlier, um, and also how they, how they translate across different uh, grammars. And so I had mentioned in the, in the talk also, I'd cited this short piece by uh, Miriam Tickton, where she focalizes our attention on uh, you know, different problems that humanitarianism convenes as a kind of, uh, a, a, as a certain kind of limit, right? So she talks about there's a problem of innocence, that humanitarianism produces uh, uh, distinctions among, you know, benefactors and beneficiaries, but specifically along the lines of, you know, saviors versus victims. She talks about the problem of emergency, that, that you know, that humanitarianism has a very kind of limited uh, temporal horizon. And she talks about the problem of compassion, you know, that humanitarianism plays on, um, on, on, on emotion to elicit certain, um, certain reactions. And that she wants to move us away from this grammar toward a different, toward, you know, various other political and affective grammars. And so um, what I was trying to draw forth, I would say, is that you know, many of the same elements of uh, of these the, these kind of humanitarian borders, the humanitarian problems of innocence, of emergency, of compassion, and so on, they're also all still there, you know, in this this project of Islamic ethics or Islamic pedagogy, um, but uh, but they operate differently according to a different grammar, and so um, and, and and so I think it was also kind of my 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 caveat at the talk was basically to uh, signal that I was I was it's not a completely different ethical scene. It's, it's, you know, in some ways, it's responsive to some of those other concerns. But there is a different grammar here. And that's what I'm trying to focus on. And so I'm less concerned, I would say, about, you know, about the, the, you know, particularities of, of some of my interlocutors and how they, um, you know, how, how secular or how religious their lives are in other terms, right, but focusing on the, the grammar of this project. So, and this one is a, a kind of a more theoretical question that is a little broader for China. And I think Basit, you could probably speak to it 
uh, as well. Um, so China's critique of gift economy theory unsettles common assumptions about the quote unquote symbolic violence that charity inflicts on local African communities through modes of dependence and hierarchy. Um, extrapolating be beyond the African case, what consequences does this argument that you make here raise for the scope and validity of decolonial or post-colonial theory in its treatment of humanitarianism? Is there something bigger that can be uh, taken away from, from your critique here about the field as a, as a whole? I think that, that it, to my thinking, most of our sort of looking historically about sort of this critique of dependency and where that where that comes out of in the sort of post enlightenment moment and kind of thinking about the history of that argument and the way that gift theory gets situated um, within a very particular understanding of um, of charity my guess is that in most of the world things are more like interdependence and and thinking about those kinds of relationships than not. That said, um, I don't want to try to make a claim that like this would apply anywhere in the world. It's rather a set of, it's rather a kind of rubric to ask a question and to say, well, how does dependency work in this place before we make the sort of initial move of saying like, oh, there's dependency, there's higher, we've got to get rid of that. And, and rather than to think that you're as, you know, sort of intervening humanitarian NGO person are going to first rewrite all of the cultural scripts and then implement the school feeding program, that to think about sort of what are the sort of ethical arrangements already existing in this place and how might our programs look against those. And given the sort of wide array of ethnographic work that's already out there and being able to have a couple of conversations with some friends over tea as you sort of settle down to do the humanitarian work, you'd probably be able to figure out a lot of that. And in many cases, as with Hope Child, the people who were running those projects were already, they were also Ugandans and they were also engaged in these kinds of relationships in their own lives. It's the, it's the sort of international donor-driven frameworks and, and those need to be much more sensitive to local logic. So I'm not sure that it would work out the same, play, same way everywhere, but I've had enough conversations with people about this work who say, yep, Papua New Guinea, same thing. Guatemala, same thing. And, and sort of wanting to kind of think about um, not, not to either universalize this framework, but to use it as a question that might be asked um, and, and that, that donors really need to be responsive to. Basit, if you want to, to answer to this or to respond, react to it, you're welcome to, but I'm just gonna add one question from the audience and then you can choose what how you want to respond to both. Um, so you mentioned that Abu Bakr's effort of honing people's capacities to endure through tribal tribulation were not understood by international NGOs. And so the uh, audience members are wondering if, uh, if or how people in the camp relate to Abu Bakr's efforts and also to the limits that he poses to his presence in the camp. I'd say maybe going, just going back to, to, to what China was just saying, you know, trying to insist not on a, you know, th that, that we've got humanitarianism here and charity over here, and we need to, you know, turn away from humanitarianism and turn toward charity. And instead she's, you know, uh, um, arguing that we need to instead, you know, not reject these kinds of uh, relations of dependency and so on out of hand and instead, you know, consider, um, you know, consider how interdependence and hierarchy have, I think the, the phrase in, in the talk was something about like a, a, either a positive or at least ambivalent moral traction. And, and so I think that that is also, you know, something that really resonated with me as well, you know, certainly not um, to set up, you know, Islamic charity on the one hand and then secular humanitarianism on the other, and then offer, um, you know, an account of, of an Islamic humanitarianism that can be, you know, that instead of focusing on on bare humanity focuses on, you know, a figure of Islamic community. And instead of, uh, you know, emphasizing crisis, instead has a tribulation. And instead of, um, you know, it's, so it's not this kind of one-to-one -one analogy, but instead looking at how different projects um, are kind of interrelated. Um, I think this, this question about the, the reception of Abu Bakr's work, I think would take, um, 
it would it would take more uh, field work certainly. Uh, it's kind of a an anthropological cop out maybe to make that kind of claim. I think what 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 struck me about or what led me to the term of ambivalence in my own um, paper here, just like how. Uh, it, a term that, that that's held in common, I think, with China talking about this ambivalent uh, moral kind of traction, is um, a different kind of ambivalence that I did encounter with a student at one of these programs, who was facing different horizons. One was, you know, a return to Syria, a return, a res resettlement to Canada, um, or staying in the camp, and. The role that um, this project of Islamic pedagogy played in his decision seemed crucial over the course of our conversations because it was through this program of, um, of, of pedagogy and so on that he was able to rediscover aspects of his tradition that you know in his former life um, remained opaque and he was in, and he was disinterested and so on. Um, and so for him, the camp had become the space of a certain kind of passage. Um, and so there was a way, you know, at least for this student in particular, that, that the, 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 this moral project um, reframed these different horizons, right? And so we can say like modulated his ambivalence in different ways. Um, but I think to, to talk more broadly, kind of beyond um, a few people that I got the chance to know more closely, it would take a, a different kind of project. We have reached the end of today's webinar, as Christian mentioned, and we would like to thank Professors Basit Iqbal and China Shirts, and our technical organizers, especially Caitlin Palo, and of course, all of you for your continued interest. And we look forward to hosting you again April 1st, we will welcome novelist, historian, author, Professor Sinan Antoun. For more information about our series, please head to humanitarianisms.org and um, feel free to write us if you have any questions. But in the meantime, have a great evening, day, wherever you are. And thank you once again for tuning in. Good night. Thank you.